Awesome, Jason. We're live. Welcome to the show. Yes, Brian. Good to be back. So, Jason, we had you on the podcast a couple of years ago. It was one of, um, I think, everybody's favorite episode, and it was how entrepreneurs get healthcare insurance. And mm-hmm. this is, you know, sort of a more of a localized here in the U.S. based podcast for all the international listeners out there. But uh, we got a lot to cover. Jason, just tell us a bit about your background and kind of how you got into this space. So, my father's been doing health insurance for. 20, yeah, 40 years. So since he was probably in his 20s, uh, I got licensed um, when I was 19 before I went on a church mission. And um, so I've been uh, I've been licensed since I was 19. And, and uh, even through college uh, at Brigham Young University, I was you know, working leads that my dad was giving me a little bit. I got a degree in accounting. I probably should have just done basket weaving and chase girls, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard for a degree that uh, I I actually went and worked for one of the big four for a year. So I, I guess I can relate to your podcasters here a little bit uh, um, that I did take the job. One of the, you know, worked for uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Irvine. So I worked for the, you know, for somebody else for a little while, always knowing I was eventually just going to full dive into health insurance. But uh, I figured if I was going to get the degree in it, that I would at least go, you know, try it out for a little bit. Um, um, dip, you got to dip your toe in the water. And usually yeah. you go to the big four and two years later, you're like, ah, I'm ready to move on. I'm out. Yeah, so. <laughs> it, was good. it was a good experience. It was fun to live in California. But uh, um, so, yeah, so I've been doing this since I was, you know, it's been 20 years now um, that I've been doing health insurance. And so it's changed. Obviously, it changed uh, back in 2014 when the Affordable Care Act passed. Initially, it was a scary moment for us brokers. A lot of us thought that was uh you know, nobody really likes change. I think that's probably a part of your podcast too, is, you know, why people maybe hold back from going self-employed is the change, but it ended up being a good change um, for us and just really simplifies the health insurance. So that's awesome. Thanks to the background. And let's, let's just dive in. I think your help, you know, you got two decades of experience, even before the Affordable Care Act, even after we sort of were talking about the Affordable Care Act um, right before we jumped on the call. And that sort of is, you know, two years ago when we first recorded this, it was sort of like up in the air. This seems to be law of the land. Maybe give us just the, the little synopsis, synopsis of the Affordable Care Act, what that is, what that means yeah. for all of us. So what it means is, you know, back before 2014 and you wanted health insurance, you had to go through medical underwriting. And so if you were at a job where you had your health care, there was a chance that there wasn't a good landing spot for your family with your health care based on your health. Um, um, if somebody needed, a, you know, if they found that you had a herniated disc, they're just going to assume that you want to have that operated on and they're either going to give you a really large rate increase or possibly even deny you. That's no longer the case. So really what the Affordable Care Act did was it got rid of pre-existing conditions with health care. And despite all of the attempts to repeal it, um, when certain parties have had full control to maybe change it, the plans they've come up with were almost very similar, where it was very popular to have pre-existing conditions covered. Nobody wanted to get rid of that. And then also they wanted to give discounts based on income. And so the bottom line is here we are, and it's, it's here to stay um, for probably a very long time. Um, now, the last time we spoke, and I, I imagine anyone that wants to listen to that one before this one can get a... Uh, you know, get a lead in into the Affordable Care Act, but there used to be a cliff. So with the Affordable Care Act, there were discounts based on your income, but those discounts would only, you were only eligible for the discounts up to 400% of poverty. So just so that you know what that is, for a single individual, that's $54,000 in 2023. Um, For a family of two, that's 73,000. Family of three, 92,000, family of four, 111,000, family of five, 129,000, family of six, 148,000, so on and so forth. Every child's worth about another, you know, $19,000. So the bottom line is there was a time where if a family of five called me for health insurance, if their income was under the $129,000, that could be a seven or $800 a month discount. At $139,000, $130,000, the discount was completely gone. It was a cliff. And so it put a lot of stress on me as an um, insurance broker to also now become kind of a tax accountant where it was like, are you sure you want to make that extra $1,000 and cost yourself seven or $800 a month in insurance? You know, that extra $1,000 is going to cost you 
so 10 great. grand on the back end. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to do that. And so that's where you would teach them to go put a little money in their IRA. So the good news is back in 2020, when COVID was going on, uh, as part of the American Rescue Package, they expanded the subsidies. And so instead of it just completely, you know, falling off a cliff, if you went over the, the 129880 as a family of five, now it just slowly phases out to where you don't pay complete full price in Utah for a family of five until you're over 220 grand. And it was a temporary fix for 2021 and 2022. And with this Inflation Reduction Act, it's now expanded through 2025. And so what happens now is, you know, there are discounts. Obviously, the lower the income, the more discounts you get, but you will get some discounts um, you know, even at higher incomes now. And so that's a change that does help, you know, more clients get more affordable, you know, insurance. So so that's pretty cool. And let me summarize that a little bit too, Jason, to make sure I'm, I'm understanding it right. Okay. So it used to be that once you hit a certain amount of money and in income, you fell off right. a cliff and then, you know, basically you lost right. all discounts. Um, it's That was all fun and games until you hit that cliff. And then it wasn't yeah. very interesting anymore. So What's actually better about this is it sort of tapers off over time. Yes. So you're you're not like sort of this weird perverse incentive to like, oh, I want to make, you know, if you're on the borderline of like, oh, I can make an extra $5,000, but it's going to yes. cost me $10,000 in healthcare insurance. Yeah. You weren't doing it. And so now that's sort of just tapering. So that, people so that, aren't fighting that at the end it. of the year. Yeah, that simplifies it for us, uh, simplifies it for everybody. And, and roughly every $1,000 more or less is about $8 a month more or less of discount. I mean, that's the way to put it. Um, and so that's, you know, so so like in Utah, if I'm talking about a family of five, for example, you know, somebody making $125,000 can probably get a $700 a month discount. And it used to be at 130, it was nothing. Well, now even at 150,000, you know, they're maybe getting a $500 discount, maybe at 175,000, they're getting a $300 discount. And it's not phasing completely out until, you know, over 200 and probably $20,000 now. Um, and that can change based on age and family size. So, so one thing um, just to kind of talk about Ryan is, you know, with, you know, with this healthcare, we were talking about earlier, we're about to jump into open enrollment. I get a lot of calls during open enrollment because I think it's top of mind for a lot of people. So open enrollment is November 1st through January 15th. What that means is during that time frame, you can apply for coverage without having a loss of coverage to start care either January 1 or February 1. So you've got until December 15th to get January 1, until January 15th to get February 1, no questions asked. Okay. But that does not mean you need to wait till November to quit your job. Um, a loss of coverage is always going to be a soft landing for those into the Affordable Care Act. And so if somebody right now is on the fence about starting their own business, leaving their employer health care, um, they don't need to wait till open enrollment to make that leap. Um, they can make that leap sooner because a loss of coverage is a guarantee issue. And because the plans have to cover pre-existing conditions, there should be a good landing place for you. So open enrollment mainly is for people wanting to change if they're already in the program. They're like, hey, I want to make this change, but I haven't lost coverage or haven't had like a life event or anything like that, yes. right? Mostly for people who really just don't even, even have health insurance and are just wanting to jump in um, that don't have the qualifying event, yes. Um, also, it's a year where you make changes. And because each year open enrollment, you're kind of attesting to an income. And that's one thing that's kind of hard about the Affordable Care Act is you know, your discounts are based on your income estimate. And there's been debates on what's the best way to do this. I think the way they've got it now is probably the best way is you're guessing for the upcoming year. Now it's hard, right? Because if I'm talking to somebody self-employed here next month, I'm trying to have them guess what they're going to make in 2023. They're not even going to know until April what they made in 2022. And so the bottom line is you're not going to get it right there's going to be some settle ups at tax time and that just simply settles up. So if you can give your best guess at tax time, if you end up making more, you're going to owe some of those discounts back. If you make a ton more, you might owe all your discounts back. Vice versa, if you end up making less, you know, you're going to get those discounts, you know, back at tax time. And I think that's one thing to focus on is if somebody's trying to 
you know, leave an employer, go self-employed, take that leap of faith. You know, if you're not sure where your income's at and the income's lower when you first start out self-employed, you know, you can estimate lower and get more discounts. In fact, when you estimate lower, they actually unlock better plans. Um, that was, I think, on a, the previous podcast, and we can get into that more that we need to. But, you know, the bottom line is, if that's holding you back and you're not sure where your income is going to come in, you can estimate lower. And then at tax time, if you make more, you'll owe it back, but at least by then you've made it right. Whereas maybe right off the bat, you know, that 13, 14, 1500 a month for a family, or if you're single, maybe it's only three or $400 a month. You know, maybe that's a lot to swallow when you don't really have the revenue stream coming in that you're anticipating down the road. And, and we've talked a lot about on this podcast. You're going to go through a, a valley, right? When you leave your day job and you buy a business or you, you start a business, you're not going to make as much as you made previously. It's very rare. Um, if I'm understanding this right, so so now it's open enrollment. People could join now. Um, but at the same time, if I were to leave my W-2 right now, I would be able to jump into the Affordable Care Act. That's the healthcare.gov. Um, and then the way it's structured is it's based on um, my estimated income looking forward, which is sort of tricky. And that's why you have those, yep. you know, you get true ups, whether it's above or you get some money right. back, it's yep. kind of your estimated income. And then the second piece, Jason is tied to my family size, right? right. Um, is there anything with age or do pre-existing conditions factor at all? I know they have the to accept those, but don't funnel in at all, but okay. you know, the older you are, the more family members, the higher the premiums, the more discounts. So in general, You'll never spend more than eight and a half percent of your income on a silver plan and probably four or five percent on a bronze plan. And so if you just take you know your income and monthly income, say ten thousand dollars, round number, you know, eight point five percent of that's eight hundred and fifty dollars on a silver plan and four percent is about four hundred dollars on a bronze plan. So even at one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, you shouldn't be spending more than, Eight percent of eight, eight or nine percent of your income on a silver plan, about four or five on a bronze plan, and so obviously, if your age is older and maybe the pre and the premiums do go higher, so a twenty year old, um, a silver plan might be four hundred dollars a month, and a bronze plan might be two fifty a month, and then a sixty year old, a bronze plan might be six hundred a month, a silver plan might be a thousand a month, so obviously it's just more discounts to kind of get you down to where you're spending that percentage of your income. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are, there are more discounts, but really the discounts kind of bring it down to where everyone's paying kind of based on their income, regardless of pre-existing conditions. So thanks for breaking that down. And it's helpful because I, this is one of the most common questions I get is, Oh, you know, you work for yourself. What in the world do you do for, for health insurance? Right. Mm. Um, and we know, it's not a political podcast. We were talking about that earlier, but at the end no. of the day, the Affordable Care Act has sort of made it helpful for entrepreneurs out there and yes. given them more options, especially yes. with pre-existing conditions. It kind of allows you to, to adjust based on like in my own personal family, it's like, are we having a baby next year? Are we not having a baby? Are we planning yeah. to have a surgery or not? You know, and I, yeah. you, you know, you start- higher deductible or a lower deductible based on, you know, what you're anticipating. Absolutely. And the other thing is, you know, I have a lot of clients, you know, I do a lot of small business policies. Okay. So for all of you that are out there that are thinking about starting a business, you know, a lot of the popular pet question that I get is Jason, um, should I just do a group plan? Well, if you're going to do a group plan and you've got three or four employees, the rates with the group plans and the affordable care Act plans are very similar. There's not much difference between a healthcare.gov plan or a group plan in the price. Um, the difference, though, is if you do a group plan, you have to be the one that discounts that group plan to make it affordable to the employee. Um, if you do individual policies and just give them money to buy their own plan, now the government's discounting it. Now, if everybody in the company is making more than 250 grand a year, absolutely, a group plan is probably going to save a little bit of money. It's actually easier for some tax write-offs. But as especially as you're ramping up, maybe you as the owner are making a higher income, but you've got a lot of employees making 40, 50, 60 grand. There's really no reason to do a group plan unless you're over 50 employees and you're mandated to offer it because I have groups. I, I have this dental office last year that all the employees thought they wanted a group plan. And once they realized um, 
you know, once they got over the fear of having to talk to me and help them get into a plan, they realized as soon as they transitioned to that group plan, it was not as good as what they were getting before. Um, even though their employer was going to pay half the premium, suddenly a single individual is now paying 200 a month for a high deductible plan or their family is paying 500 a month for a high deductible plan. They were not paying that with me, you know, through the marketplace. And so, you know, I've always talked about it like this and I've, you know, I think when you're, there is a mentality out there of an employer versus an employee mentality. Um, because I've talked to a lot of employers and they say, and I've talked to employers, they say, listen, with what everyone's being paid, the marketplace is going to be way better for everybody. They just have to talk to me and make a decision. The problem is they want a group plan because they just want you to make the decision and they don't want to deal with it. And so that's something that I think a lot of, you know, people have to kind of get over. I, now this is kind of a silly example, but I play a lot of fantasy sports in my free time. I like fantasy basketball, football, baseball. I like it all. Well, it's um, a busy season for you right now. <laughs> yeah, so everyone likes football the most, but like, I don't know, once you get into baseball, yeah, it's more time consuming, but I mean, it's, it's the best. But the bottom line is I always laugh when I make a trade request. Um, because if I, I've got a lot of buddies in these leagues, some are self-employed, some are employees. If I send a trade request to somebody self-employed, it feels like there's an answer. Yes or no, accept, reject, we move on with our lives. I have some people, it feels like I send them, and they will just sit on it. And I don't know what they're waiting for. I think they just, you know, it's, it's just part of sometimes that employee mentality versus employer mentality is just you don't want to make a decision. And so that's what I want everyone to realize is, Yes, if you're going to leave, it, you do have to make a decision. You are going to have to pick a plan. But the landing place with the Affordable Care Act, you're going to be able to get it. And based on your income, it's going to be affordable because if you're going to make $500,000 a year, well, then you should be able to afford $1,000 a month for health care to protect your family. And so you know, just don't let something like a health insurance decision you know, hold you back um, from going self-employed because in the end I, I, it's just one of many decisions that you know health insurance is one piece of the pie but once you become a business owner you know you're just going to have to start making more decisions well i really appreciate that i think i couldn't have said it better than you um, at the end of the day don't let the fear of not having health care stop you from chasing a dream chasing a business chasing that career right. change whatever you're trying to build right because ultimately there are a lot of options now and i was pretty shocked how affordable some of the options were when i I think I started working three, four or five years ago. I can't remember, probably five years ago when I jumped on. Um, so I think that sums up pretty well. But but ultimately, um, if we're summing it up, it's like there's a lot of options to fall on. You, you, you can pick which option makes the most sense for you. It's based on how many members you have in your family and sort of your age in there. Also based on your income. Um, does it change much by state? So I know that, you know, yeah, you're, you're mainly based that. in Utah. So, you know, a yeah, lot so of the, I'm, so I'm licensed in Utah. I'm also licensed in Arizona, Texas, Missouri. Um, I would be licensed in Idaho, Nevada, or, you know, neighboring states, but they have their own state exchanges. So roughly 35 states, you know, in the United States of America will participate in healthcare.gov. Okay. Um, and then it's, Others, the other, you know, 15, 16 states are going to be having their, they have their own state exchanges. Either way, the premiums and the discounts and the subsidies work the same. It's just the, you know, the enrollment platform. And so if you've got somebody, you know, that gets my contact information, I've had some send me requests over the years, you know, from all over the place. And if they're in Utah, if they're in Texas, if they're in um, Arizona, Missouri, absolutely, I can help them. I'm licensed to help them there. But a lot of times they're, they need assistance in a state that I'm not licensed, but uses healthcare.gov. I can point them in the right direction. I can send them a link where they can quote it. I can ask them about their family size and rough income estimate and give them a few tips. I just can't fully dive into it too much on plans and programs and available in their area. And then others, there's, they, they might just have a state exchange that I need to send them to. Um, so that's, that's good. Yeah. Well, well, Jason, I, that, that wraps up most of my questions that I've had. I know I've talked to you and been super helpful. Um, and what, what's also interesting is using an insurance broker like yourself. It's actually free to us users. Yeah. There's no cost to yeah. it. 
Um, I think that's something that's, that's, you know, put that out there. Use Jason. He knows what he's talking about. And every year. Honestly, if you've got people in other States and they love their broker and he knows what he's doing, give me his information. I mean, we could create a little, you know, pool of brokers because I would much prefer you know, in a state like in Indiana where I'm not licensed, but somebody needs assistance, I would love to know if there's a version of myself in Indiana, because you're absolutely right. You know, if you've got a broker that can help you go through it, there is no additional cost to have a broker go through it. Um, The prices are the same, the carriers will pay a small commission, but that broker should help you kind of navigate the options and make it easier. And I, I can definitely make it easier for anybody, you know, in the, in the states that I'm licensed, but um, you know, if anyone knows, you know, they reply to your podcast and have brokers in their states. I mean, I would love to have their information because I would gladly, you know, send them. I would gladly send leads to people in those states. Well, we'll add that there in the show notes of how people can can pass that along to you, Jason. So um, this sums up pretty well. Anything else you'd like to add or anything else we can we can dive into? Um, no, I, I think for the most part, just when you're making your healthcare decisions and, and maybe you're not ready to to take that leap quite yet and you're in its open enrollment for your group plans and you're trying to make a decision. Um, you know, for the most part, like you said, Ryan, you know, if you know, your wife's having a baby next year, you know, you're not, you, you've got a lot going on, you know, sometimes it's worth paying up for that lower deductible option. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, the numbers are stacked against you. And for the most part, don't be afraid to go with the higher deductible plans and save that difference. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, well, I want the better plan and the better plan is $500 more a month, which is $6,000 more a year. And the deductible on the high deductible plan is $6,000. And so, no, you should not be afraid of a $6,000 deductible when it's going to save you $6,000 to go for that plan because it's all a wash. <laughs> if the worst thing happens, it's a wash. And then if you have a healthy year, you know, you're ahead. And so that's not... An exact science, but just as you're making your decisions, especially if your, you know, employer is going to do HSA contributions, or especially if you're willing to put money in an HSA, you know, don't don't be afraid of just going for the, the higher deductible plans when you're running quotes in your areas. But you know, the main thing, and we've already kind of touched on it earlier, is just, you know, just realize that if what's holding you back is the cost of the healthcare. You know, you can estimate lower while your income's lower and take advantage of amazing plans and amazing prices. And at tax time, the worst thing that can happen to you is you pay back your discount. But as long as you're familiar and comfortable with what your discount is, I'm sure you'll be very happy at that point if you've blown past 200 grand because, you know, you, hopefully you've saved some for that, you know, for that reason. So. Usually that's a good thing. That's absolutely a good thing. Well, Jason, we appreciate a few minutes of your time. You said it better. This is entirely of taking the fear out of going out on your own, starting your own business, becoming your own boss. There's options to protect you and your family. There's options to protect your kids. You're not going to be left out on the streets when it comes to healthcare nowadays. So um, Jason, where can people find you and follow you and uh, reach out to you? Um, you know, I'm not much on social media, but my, my email is just Jason at Ferguson insurance.com. So it's my last name, F E R G U S O N insurance.com. I think you've shared you know, my email, um, I mean, my cell phone's 801-548-0007 if anyone wants to just shoot me a text or call me as well. But, you know, I'm, I'm good about getting back to everybody. And, um, yeah, just just call me regardless of your state. Call me. I can at least point you, you know, in the right direction. So Well, well, Jason, you're so gracious with your time. We appreciate it. We'll link to all that there in the show notes, and uh, we'll, we'll let you know when this goes out. Okay. Thanks so much, Ryan.